to another edition of Milwaukee PBS Vote 2020. I'm Portia Young from 1036. And I'm Earl Lawrence from Black Nouveau. And as you can tell, we are inside of our homes trying to keep safe with social distancing with COVID-19 out there. And speaking of, Portia, COVID-19 is not stopping this election, which is just days away. Yes, Tuesday is the big day. So we're going to look at the latest poll results and hear from some young voters who may be playing a critical role in this presidential election. First, though, we want to share a conversation I recently had with Margaret Hoover, conservative host of Firing Line on PBS. She shares her thoughts on the pandemic and its impact on the election and why she voted for Joe Biden. Portia, I don't think any issue has been more important and pivotal to the campaign, especially in your battleground state. I mean, we're seeing, you know, on all the cable news networks and in the as we look at the internet, the news from your state is that you guys are building 10 hospitals because of the danger of such high number of cases that hospitals won't be able to handle the influx of patients who need acute care. We had that in New York back in April, May, and I just had Dr. Fauci as a guest on Firing Line recently, and he was very clear that this is not where we should have been by fall. We should have been in a totally different place, learning what we have learned about the coronavirus and how to uh, stem its spread. I would have told you six weeks ago, Portia, to get to the answer to your question about how coronavirus has impacted the election, that Donald Trump was cruising towards re-election. The issues around law and order, the issues around the economy and a, a perceived rebound, uh, the, the uh, the narrative and the wind seem to be in his favor and in his sails. And two things changed it, <laughs> right back at the failures of this administration in terms of combating and handling the coronavirus. And it was one, his first debate, and two, his own contracting of the coronavirus. Just put that issue right back front and center and reminded voters and made this the story of the day and on every paper across the country that the president has coronavirus, the president is in the hospital, the president is coming home, but still has coronavirus. All of this has solidified a steep fall in his polling in battleground states and widened his, frankly, uh, the fact that he's he's losing to Joe Biden in many, many blue states and purple states. Uh, so I, I think this there's nothing, sorry for such a long-winded answer, but I, just, I actually don't think there is any issue that has been more pivotal or more impactful in the last three weeks than the coronavirus, uh, to, probably to the extent where it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for him to turn it around. There was this sense that changing the subject, but it wasn't just Donald Trump perhaps trying to change the subject. The world around him was changing the subject because people were a little bit, you know, you, it, the coronavirus just kind of is, is always there in the background, but there was the racial justice issues and social justice and um, economics and all of that was just swirling this summer. Do you think coronavirus still is the issue of the day despite everything that's happened 2020? It is right now. It, and it certainly wasn't for a period. I mean, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, it wasn't. You know, that's actually when coronavirus stopped leading the news and, uh, you know, protests around racial reconciliation and then sort of the corollary, the, the, the not so peaceful protests. And, and that story became the lead story. But I mean, Portia, what we all know is that events impact the direction of outside events that we can't control and that we can't predict end up impacting elections. And remember, it was the last week of October when Jim Comey sent an email saying that he would be reviewing the Hillary Clinton emails that had been found on Anthony Weiner's laptop. And that, if you, if you talk to anybody who was looking at internal polling in key battleground states, especially you know, Ohio, where Hillary Clinton was believed to have been winning, I mean, that was a pivotal, pivotal moment in the campaign. That was the last week of October. There's still time for outside events to change the focus of the electorate. But as every day goes by, there is a diminishing chance that that happens because more and more people are voting early because of the pandemic. And 
less there is less time to to influence the direction because the direction has been so codified for so many weeks at this point. So you have said that this election is really that binary choice, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. You have said on record that you are voting for Joe Biden, even though you are a Republican. At least I think you still are. <laughs> I'm still a Republican. <laughs> okay, okay. I have said that it is a binary choice and I have said that I won't vote for Donald Trump, um, which means I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. Uh, and, and that's a very difficult thing for a lifelong Republican, but I identify with people who have character leading our country, who care about the truth, who want to bring uh, a civility and a substance uh, to our public policy challenges, and uh, who, who care about others and who want to make this country better. Uh, and, and it's just become clear to me that that's my choice. I have Trump supporters on my program and will up until the election, because this country is still a divided country. And what I think is so important, Portia, is trying to understand all of these different perspectives so that we can move forward after this election. Much more with Margaret Hoover on moving our country forward, the Republican Party, and the new Supreme Court justice coming up later in this program. Both presidential candidates are strongly going after the Latino vote, a fast growing part of the electorate. Here's Adelante host, Patricia Gomez. There are 180,000 registered Latino voters in Wisconsin. Among them are a growing number of Generation Z voters. In 2016, the presidential election was decided by nearly 23,000 votes. And many political analysts say Jim Sears could prove to be a factor in 2020. Adelantes, Raul Galvan has more on that. The push to get out the vote in Milwaukee has been intense and bilingual. The League of Women Voters, Comité por el Voto Latino, has been at the forefront of the effort. I think there has to be culturally appropriate messages for our variety of age groups of Latinos. Part of the Comité's effort has been targeted at Latinx Gen Zers, Latinos between 18 and 24 years of age. Cardinal Stritch recently held a button-making event to raise voter awareness. Our students are really passionate and active about voting because they want to vote for those who can't. Uh, so they have friends and family members who are undocumented, um, and so they know and realize that this vote impacts not only them, but also the undocumented individuals in the in our area. Hi, my name is Esmeralda. I'm a senior here at Cardinal Stritch University. And today I stopped at the station to <laughs> Um, collect a button and to make a button because I think it's important to encourage everyone to vote this year. It's especially important for people of the Latinx community, um, minorities, to really cash in their vote, to have their voices heard. The Comité of the League of Women Voters surveyed 72 Latinx Gen Zers earlier this year about their voting habits. Current or very recent college students. Um, most of them either do vote or plan to register to vote. Um, many of them said that they would try to vote in all elections in the future and have voted in most or all elections in the past. And many of them started voting by the age of 18. Definitely immigration is a hot topic. Um, not only with asylum seekers and refugees and everything that's going down in our southern borders, but as well as DACA and all our dreamers. I think if we want DACA to still be a, uh, a thing, we have to like cash in our vote. A lot of them really focus on things like health care, environment, definitely things affecting immigration. Um, but those other things piled on top of it. A lot of social justice issues, they're very aware that not just the Latinx population is being affected, but many people of color. Another thing too was student debt. You know, what was gonna be the decision with student debt? Another, I would say another major um, issue too, uh, that a lot of Latinx and Gen Z students were looking at and trying to see like what was gonna happen with was reproductive um, rights for women. 
uh, as, and that was both across both uh, male and female students both were concerned. I think that there's been a feeling that the politicians don't really represent what they view as the needs of the community. They're committed to try to make things better. They want to leave their mark in a positive way. And who do Latinx Gen Z voters prefer? A lot of Gen Z voters are not at all a big fan of Biden, and they're even less of fans of Trump, right? But it's honestly choosing between um, the lesser of two evils and and making sure that you know uh, programs like um, health insurance and women reproductive um, rights and DACA and immigration that they know that they have a better chance of being saved and not challenged with the Biden administration versus what we've seen in the past four years with the Trump administration. That we matter and that we can make a difference. The analysts say that it will be historic if large numbers of Latinx and older Latino voters do indeed cast their votes in this presidential election. We'll see what happens. Portia, Air, back to you. Thank you, Patricia. We're going to hear from more voters now in the very latest Marquette University Law School poll. Milwaukee PBS's Raul Galvan spoke with pollster Charles Franklin just a short time ago. There has uh, been remarkably little change this year. We're at five points, five point Biden margin this time, 48 for Biden, 43 for Trump, 2% for Jorgensen, and 7% that say they either haven't decided or declined to tell us who they're voting for. Um, it was five points last month. And since May, it's been four to six points every time. Um, this has also been a long, stable run since August of 2019, when we first started asking. Biden has averaged about a four-point lead over that time, with Trump ahead once and a tie one time. This is less variability than we saw in 2016, and it's also less than we saw in 2012. And Charles, could there really be 7% of those 800 plus and over 50 people that really don't know who they're voting for yet? <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of that going around. Here's the thing, there's an artifact in that. Um, a little bit to my surprise, people who have already voted are more likely to decline to tell us their choice than people who haven't voted yet when we ask them how they will vote. Um, that, because 40% of people have already voted, it's driving up that percent that declined to say. You referred to, the, uh, to those who have already voted um, and under the choice of ballot type, uh, you, had, uh, you had the results of 41% already voted among registered voters. 64% for Biden and 25% for Trump. That's not surprising, is it? No, we had seen a very high percentage of Democrats choosing to vote early, and, and we've seen that intention all summer long and into the fall. The early vote has become a bit more mixed uh, in the last few weeks as uh some Democrats have decided to vote on Election Day, but some Republicans have moved over and decided to go ahead and vote early. As a result, it's still a pretty sharp divide between a more heavily Democratic early vote and a more Republican Election Day vote. Charles, thank you so much for having uh, shared your time with us uh, these last four months. It's been fascinating, and uh, and I'm curious to see um, how your uh, how your numbers match up with the results. <laughs> you think I'm a little curious about that too, do you? <laughs> well, in a week we should know, and uh, when the votes are finally counted, we'll see. Thanks again, Charles, and now back to you, Portia and Earl. That five-point lead has been pretty steady for Joe Biden here in Wisconsin in the Marquette University Law School poll. But we know what happened in 2016, right, Earl? That we do, Portia. Uh, it was the last law school poll before the election. Hillary Clinton was up six points 
on Donald Trump, but of course, Trump going on to win the Wisconsin and the presidency. So uh, that lead not far off from where Joe Biden sits right now. Exactly. And we'll see what happens. The electorate seems like it's going to be a record breaking turnout, according to what Charles Franklin talked to when he spoke with voters in that poll. For another perspective on what voters are seeing statewide, let's turn to Zach Schultz, senior political reporter for Here and Now on PBS Wisconsin in Madison. Thanks for joining us, Zach. My pleasure, Portia. All right, let's start off with the election. Zach, you've been talking with voters across the state for some time now. What's the turnout been like and what are you hearing from voters? Well, turnout looks like it's going to exceed 2016, possibly by a large margin. It's, it's kind of hard to tell because the absentee numbers that we've had so far, 1.8 million ballots requested, 1.5 million already returned, are way out of the ballpark of anything we've ever seen before. So it's you have to go by polling and what the polling says about those numbers. And what we've learned is that According to the polls, the majority of those voters are Joe Biden supporters, while a lot of Donald Trump supporters plan to wait until Election Day. So that's one big factor to, to look at what those numbers mean right now. But there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm among, among voters. You travel the state and there are signs everywhere, perhaps more signs than what you saw in 2016. So, Zach, all eyes are going to be on Wisconsin and a key other battleground states. but. What could slow down the election results here in Wisconsin on election night? Well, all those absentee ballots we just talked about, Wisconsin's not used to having to count that many, and state law does not allow them to start, start counting early like they do in some other states where they're used to having a lot of absentee mail-in ballots. So on election night, the people that vote in person will vote in their own precinct or ward. Those results will be tabulated and posted by the county clerks as, as per every other election that we're used to seeing. But those absentee ballots, and especially in high population counties like Dane County or Milwaukee County, are going to be sent to a central count location where they will tabulate them all there. And that could take quite some time. In some of these cases, it's a number of volunteers are placing them in machines one at a time, double checking everything. And that could go last well into the evening. And because of that discrepancy in what voters are voting early versus in person, on election night, it may look like Donald Trump has a lead when the polls officially close and we get some of those first in-person vote numbers back. But later in the evening, we could be waiting for large numbers of votes that will overwhelmingly support Joe Biden and could change the perception of where that vote is. So one thing the Elections Commission is recommending is that those counties make sure they're very transparent about how many absentee ballots are remaining to be counted. So no one's surprised when all these ballots numbers come in at the end and possibly swing the election one way or the other. Thank you, Zach. Zach Schultz, senior political reporter for PBS Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. We want to turn now to our porch politics producers for their final take on voters they met in Southeast Wisconsin during these last few weeks. After a couple dozen yeses and more rejections than we could count, porch politics gave us a chance to hear from voters like you on what issues are most pressing. Now, with election day right around the corner, we're taking a stroll down memory lane to revisit some of those conversations with voters across the Milwaukee area. So Lexi, what stood out to you? Scotty, the biggest contrast that stood out to me was how people in the city of Milwaukee were so differently impacted by the pandemic versus the suburbs and the wild counties. I got laid off up in March from the pandemic. Um, since about March, I haven't been able to pay my rent because of me being laid, laid off. Um, I've filled out for unemployment since March 15th. I haven't got when we went to the wild counties, people were really only saying they were being impacted socially, not being able to see their friends as much, but not see any substantial financial impacts. Has the pandemic affected you in any way? No. Has the pandemic affected you or your family in any way? Actually, no, not really, no. For me, what really stood out was going to the wow counties and seeing if we would run into any traditional Republicans who for whatever reason could not stand President Trump and would actually be casting their votes for Joe Biden this election. I have voted Republican my, my whole life um, and uh, the minute 
uh, Donald Trump was nominated, uh, you know, four years ago, was the minute I decided that I was going to change that. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be voting for, for Biden. What about Biden supporters? What are some common themes that you heard from them? Well, I think the biggest theme that we found was that Biden supporters weren't really enthusiastic to be voting for him. They were more so anti-Trump or anyone but Trump. <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest with you, anybody but Donald Trump, man. I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't care just about who it is, even if it was my grandson over there. I spoke to him. <laughs> if the election were tomorrow, who would you vote for? Hmm, obviously Biden. And are you excited about his candidacy? Let's just say he's the best out of a bad situation. And on the flip side, Trump supporters that we spoke with were very enthusiastic about voting for Trump. They will have his back no matter what happens uh, throughout the course of this campaign. Now, that being said, they were critical of some of the language that the president uses and some of his rhetoric. I think he goes about the presidency uh, all wrong in certain aspects. Um, he is the shock and awe. He is the Howard Stern of the presidency. You know, the other thing that really stood out to me with Trump supporters was some of the messaging that we heard time and time again from folks like Martin in West Dallas, that law and order. It's time to restore law and order in our country. I just think we, we need to keep things moving in a safe and controlled environment rather than chaotic and change. I certainly like justice for all and I like treating all people equally and as I told you I've been a professor at a number of colleges but I'm concerned about the underlying perhaps uh, movement or background of Black Lives Matter or Antifa or, or anything that might be subterfuged, that concerns me. So Lexi, final takeaways. I think the biggest takeaway for me was how refreshing it was to get out and speak to real voters, not, you know, just reading what the news is telling us or um, what, you know, our families or friends. We got to really get a range of opinions from very different people. It was such a, a great exercise to hear the nuances of beliefs out there and um, I was thrilled to do it. I hope we get to do it again. Uh, I think we found a lot of insight from it, and I uh, hope our viewers did too. Yeah. It's time to hear more from Margaret Hoover about the future of the Republican Party and where our country goes from here. Trumpism will still be there. There is still going to be a, a populist element of Trumpism that is probably going to be supported by senators like Tom Cotton and Josh Hawley and, frankly, Mike Pompeo, who uh, Rick Scott, all these uh, senators, Secretary of State, current Secretary of State, you know, have their eye on the presidency and, and want to carry the mantle of Trumpism forward. Uh, there's going to be a real question about whether they're going to be able to. Uh, but the things I wrote in my book 10 years ago, that the party has to address the critical issues of our time with solutions that make sense to people and to a broader group of Americans than ever before still is true, right? Climate change, immigration, you know, economic malaise, uh, healthcare, <laughs> you name it. Uh, the party's got to get more innovative. It's got to have more ideas and it's got to sell those ideas broadly. It's got to reach out to people of color in a far more sincere and earnest way than it ever has before. And, and that's, that's not just African Americans, but it is African Americans, and it's also Latin, uh, Latin, Latinx, uh, and LGBTQ, and women, especially, um, especially women of color, and you know the party. The party just it, it really needs to get serious about how to be a party that's going to be competitive for this country and to the next generation. I want to pivot to Supreme Court. For Amy Coney Barrett herself, she's she's a, clearly a, a brilliant woman um, by all accounts. We know what her personal views are. We know how she feels about abortion. She doesn't like it. We know how she feels about you know LGBT equality. Se seems as though uh, seems as though she's not a fan. She's been we she, we've been pretty clear about what her personal political views are. You know, the the question, and I think the nuance that's lost in this debate is just because those are her personal views can one extrapolate that she will rule using those views to inform her interpretation of the law? Or is she, as she suggests, and as conservatives suggest, going to be somebody who strictly interprets the texts and relies on stare decisis as, as a guideline 
for how to interpret the text. In other words, you know, will she rely on the Obergefell decision, which is decided by the court, uh, which is, the, of course, the Supreme Court case that decided same-sex marriage is legal? You know, that has been decided. Will she rely on stare decisis and, you know, uphold the text rather than try to find meaning in the text that supports her own point of view. I mean, that is judicial activism that conservatives deride all the time. And so, it, you know, it would have been nice to see a real national debate and examination around uh, a way to figure out how she will rule. She has only been a judge. I mean, the, the best way you have to do that is to look at somebody's judicial record. And it's always better if somebody has a long history of rulings so that you can try to discern how they rule. Um, you know, Brett Kavanaugh had 10 years on uh, a circuit court. You see, you had, there are a lot of rulings that you could look at to try to determine how he would rule. She has much fewer. Uh, and, and so I think that's the risk with her is because you don't know how much her personal views will influence uh, her rulings. Where do we go next as a country? I just, I hope there's a lot of healing, Portia. I really hope that there's a lot of healing. If Joe Biden were to win, I suspect he will have a, a very, uh, and I hope that he would have a very graceful and generous uh, opportunity to, to bring people in and start to heal and rebuild. Uh, even by bringing you know, Republicans in that he knew, is, know, knew, knew from the Senate after having been there for many, many years um, to help try to find things that they can work together on. Um, to really set a new tone and try to try to just take take the sting out of the ratcheted up hyperpolarization that has um, I think sickened Washington and the country. I think our greatest challenge right now is um, our our inability or what feels like our inability to to trust one another and to build um, together and to confront the basic challenges in front of us like self governance. <laughs> And thank you for having me on Milwaukee PBS because uh, it, this is this is one of Firing Line's favorite stations, and uh, and I we know the the love is mutual. Yes, our viewers do appreciate Firing Line, and I think they also appreciate your fresh perspective and the voice that you bring to public television. So thank you, Margaret Hoover. is always a pleasure to talk to. Remember to watch her on PBS's Firing Line, Fridays at 7.30, right here on Milwaukee PBS. That's gonna wrap up this edition of Milwaukee PBS Vote 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Earl Arms. And I'm Portia Young. Remember to vote.